the right door. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's quiet time. It is titled Knocking the Right Door. So not only will we focus on learning how to knock the right door, but we also want to know once we do knock on the right door, what does all that entail? It's a little bit more than what meets the eye and it's a bit more than what we've been told over the years. So today we're going to focus in on knocking the right door. Hopefully this quiet time will be beneficial to you. Amen. As always, we start out with our mission statement, which is we are a group of people desiring to draw closer to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ through Christ Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And like we say always, this helps us to understand that Jesus does have a father. And so as a result, he is son of God and son of man. We've done that study. We will continue to do studies like that. So it'll become even more and more evident that Jesus has a father and that father is also our spiritual father. And so Jesus himself is not the father, but he does act as a father to us. For as it said in John 1, he created all things and all things were created through him. Him being the word of God, he and the father is one. So you can't say you were created by the Father and not say you were created by Jesus when God spoke you into existence and Jesus is the Word of God. Amen. All righty, in drawing closer, we focused on specific passages each week. Today, we're gonna do a deep dive into Luke chapter 11. Today's quiet time is gonna be a little bit different and it has been over the weeks. And that is because we're not going to do the recap game. We're not going to have an open discussion. So today we're going to focus here on first in chapter 11, verse one through four, the book of Luke in the NIV. And it's Jesus's teaching on prayer. And so we'll see here, it's a little bit different than how we've been taught many times and how the focus is only on verses one through four, but we will focus on one through four here in the outset. And so it says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, but we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. So for years we've been taught, well, this is learning how to pray and this is really the prayer you should do and leave it at that. And so for years there's been disciples, Christians, for years just doing verses one through four and calling it a day. Well, we're going to learn a little bit more than that today. And so even in focusing here on one through four, it's even a little bit more than what meets the eye. First of all, he's saying, Father, hallowed be your name. So we know that the Father's name, he's not saying a specific name, just in Father alone and the spirit and who you're addressing is hallowed be your name. And so that father focused on the spiritual father is there's no wickedness in that father. There's no evil in that father. It's pure, straight up, all good, all awesome, all spirit. There's nothing negative in the Father at all. And so that's who you're approaching, purity upon purity. And you're saying your kingdom come. And so if the Father's name is hallowed and he's pure and there's no darkness, then that's the kingdom that you're asking to come. And it says you're supposed to do that. You're praying your kingdom come. Well, if your kingdom come, that means some other kingdom go, right? You know, there's not gonna be two of those at the same time on an eternal level. So you're asking for the eternal kingdom to arrive and for the temporary carnal kingdom to leave. 
A lot of people in just learning verses one through four really don't know that that's what you're actually praying for. And so that activity starts to go on immediately. That starts to happen in your life where his kingdom comes and the other kingdom has to go. And then it finds itself in a wrestling match. And a lot of times that wrestling match is not good. And it's because you didn't even know that there was going to be a wrestling match as soon as you did this prayer. You just said your kingdom will come without necessarily understanding what it is that you're asking for. In verse three, where it says, give us each day our daily bread. Well, a lot of people take that verse and take it out of context and say, okay, giving us each day our daily bread. Not understanding that you can't take verse three and erase verse two. So it's give us each day our daily bread in reference to your kingdom come. And so here is this righteous kingdom to take out this unrighteous kingdom where Jesus says, I came to the earth to what? To, to overcome the devil's works, right? To destroy the devil's works. So here you're asking for daily bread in order for this to be accomplished. That means it's not just normal everyday bread. Now you could break it down into the carnal physical world and say, well, of course it's for us and our physical needs to have daily bread. But ultimately you could have that and not be asking for the kingdom to come. So obviously he's talking about spiritual bread first and foremost as it relates to a spiritual kingdom. And so the spiritual bread is the word of God. And so when it says, give us each day our daily bread, then you have right to petition God as it relates to this daily bread. Well, God gave us the Bible. And back then they didn't have the Bible so readily available like we do now. Only a few people had the scriptures, the scroll back in the day. Well, we have the Bible at random. You got uh, all types of different versions. You can go online and get it. You got Bibles laying around the house. I know I did as a kid. My mom had a Bible around the house and stuff like that. So it's on you now to go and say, let me get this daily bread. And so God did that. He brought forth to us the word of God in text, in online, etc. So today, among any days, there's no excuse to not go ahead and get that daily bread. So in verse two, as you ask for your kingdom come, in verse three, you have to be strengthened because your kingdom come is combating against another kingdom and you're going to need this bread as strength to combat that other kingdom because you're talking about the kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness. And so then in verse four, it says, forgive us our sins. So we need to be reminded every day that our sins are forgiven. We need to understand that if our sins are forgiven, then we're different people, right? We're different kind. It says we're new creation. So you can't be holding on to the old person at the same time as our sins being forgiven. So we do need to be reminded because what will happen? We will revert back to that old person. So we need to be reminded that forgive us our sins. So we need the daily word and that daily word will also help us to be that forgiven person, which means a person of gratitude. And then it says, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And so we're asking for basically an overflow of forgiveness. God says he has a what? He's rich in mercy. And so we have that richness so that we have enough sustenance to forgive other people, right? Because we're full of forgiveness. So if you're full of gratitude, then you will give that gratefulness, that that, that forgiveness to others and prayerfully and hopefully that they will have that gratitude. And ultimately, it's all gotta be connected to your kingdom come. So it's not enough just for you to forgive somebody from you. You have to forgive somebody from Christ and show them that you too are failing and have failed and fall short. And as a result, everybody's working together. And so that in lies your kingdom come, the word every day, forgiving one another, us moving forward and not holding grudges. You don't wanna be carrying over 
uh, something that somebody did to you yesterday and carrying it into the next day if you need these forgiveness of sins every day, all right? And then it says, and lead us not into temptation. So we're not gonna be led into temptation with temptation to sin, and yet we're born in sin, then we can't be led into temptation to start trying to be living by the law, to live outside of faith, because faith is credited as righteousness, to, to, to not forgive people, to be tempted not to forgive people, to hold on to hurts and pains of the past, etc. Because why? Because we need room for the kingdom to come, because the kingdom is within. Amen. So that's helping us draw closer because all of this was a prayer to the Father. So just understanding one through four will take a little bit of digging in, let alone what's to come thereafter. Amen. Hallelujah. All righty. So we're going to open this up with an opening prayer. And in Luke chapter 11, we're going to stay there. We're going to move into verses five through eight in the NIV and before the prayer and just read what the verses say here and it says then Jesus said to them suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say friend lend me three loaves of bread a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him all right so when it says suppose you have a friend this is an analogy of Jesus teaching them how to pray in verses one through four. So you can't go, hey, let me just do this exact prayer in verses one through four, not really know what it means. And then of course, if Jesus just told them, cause they didn't say, tell us the words to say, and that is all it is. He says, teach us how to pray. And so when Jesus does verses one through four, that's not teaching. That's just, well, here's the words to say. That's why he says, say. These are the words to say. And now he's starting to give analogies, illustrations, understanding behind verses one through four. So verse five is a continuation of Jesus teaching them how to pray. And he says, suppose you have a friend. Well, Abraham is considered a friend of God. So he said, you go to the Father, how be thy name, right? You ask the Father. You say to the Father, your kingdom come, give us this day our daily bread. You can't be the friend of God without having faith being credited as righteousness like Abraham. So here you have to say, suppose you have a friend. So he's using the friend analogy and saying, okay, if you go to the Father, here's an example. Suppose you have a friend. And you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, right? What, what did he say? Each day, give us this day our daily bread. So you go to this friend and you ask for three loaves of bread. And you say a journey, you know, friend came to me on a journey and I have no food to offer him. And then he says, and suppose the one inside answers. So and then suppose the one inside answers. So here is this analogy, right? Don't bother me. Suppose that person says, don't bother me. The door is already locked my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. So one, the friend is hearing him. So when he says, ask the father this, he's saying, okay, you can expect some type of answer. But a suppose this answer was like this. Now, father is hallowed be thy name. So he's not really going to answer like this. But suppose he did. He says in verse eight, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, right? Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up, get up and give you as much as you need. So he's using an analogy just in a friend. If the friend was already in, the kids were all in, right? The children are all in, they're all tucked in. And you're asking him for bread from outside, from outside the door, right? Because he's saying, you know, you you came and you asked the friend and you're, the door is already locked. So he's not opening the door to have this conversation. He's, he's answering from the inside. So he says, suppose that was to go down. And he says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, right? Even though you're a friend of God by faith, and even go, though this is not necessarily how God would respond, God's gonna respond better than this. 
Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Well, there is a shameless audacity attached to this as it relates to us. Because we fall short of the glory of God. And basically we have no right. We have nothing that we've earned, not by the law. We fall short. And so we don't have the right to knock on the door and ask for something and expect it. So in here, in this situation, we really can't even say friend. But only by faith can you say friend. But God is saying, even if you're at a point where you're not necessarily even at the friendship level, but you have the shameless audacity to come to God, because for one, you must believe that he exists, and you come to him in that particular situation, like, you know, the woman at the well who had five husbands or whatever. And then you had the woman who were caught in adultery. And both of those people were able to have this conversation with Jesus, God in the flesh, and yet come out of the situation favorably and receive that forgiveness. And so he's saying you can receive that forgiveness by approaching God, asking for it, and having shameless audacity because you really don't have any right to. So I'm gonna go ahead and pray here and ask God to hear us out even though we don't have any you know, literal right. We do have faith, but it's based on God's mercy because even the faith we have, he gave that to us. And so let me go ahead and pray to the Father on our behalf, dear Lord, we want to come to you this morning and today. Thank you for everything that you've done for us, son, and your son, um, death on a cross. It gives us the opportunity to even pray to you in your mercy, God, to allow us to reach the holy room where you are and that our prayers are being brought to you um, by angels and golden bowls, Father. And here you're calling us saints and the priesthood, and yet, we fall short on a continued basis. So we know that we really don't have any type of right. We can't come to you with this entitlement mindset. We have to come to you and fall prostrate before the cross and thank you for even listening to us, Father, and, and having that shameless audacity to approach you anyway, because we just know that you are so loving and you prove that by, by the demonstration of your son going to the cross. and and how Jesus is so incredible that he was willing to do that sacrifice for us and how much more we must be in our spiritual selves. And so we can't get to that spiritual self unless we die to this old self, Father. So we know that we're asking for your kingdom to come and we know that means that this old temporary kingdom have to go. And as a result, there's going to be a battle. There's going to be a fight. And just by making the prayer in Luke 1 through 4, we have a spiritual battle as you're starting to explain to us as we study out here, verses 5 through 8. And so, Father, just help us to understand, gain more clarity of your word, to do what we need to do to stay focused on you, that we would continue to come to you for our daily bread, which is your word, Father. And we knock on that door and ask for that understanding and wisdom, which you say you give to us without holding it back and holding anything against us, Father. And so we just come to you asking for that and, and asking for understanding, Father. And we just thank you for your son. And because of him, we're able to do this. And it's in his name, Jesus, that we pray to you. Amen. Amen. As I said earlier, we're going to go ahead and go straight to the dig in because there's a lot of material. And so we're going to continue in Luke chapter 11 and verses 9 through 21. And as we see and we'll see that it is a continuation of Jesus teaching them how to pray. And so we understand here that Jesus teaching how to pray is not just words. It's not just, hey, do exactly what, you know, say exactly what I told you to say in Luke 1 through 4 and call it a day. When you say teach me, it means train me. It means walk me through it. It means help me understand it. Because when you say, you know, your kingdom come, there's going to be a battle. And so you have to be taught and trained how to navigate in this battle that's about to happen when you make that prayer. And so there's been many, many folks not prepared and have made that prayer, not knowing necessarily what it means. And then the spiritual battle comes 
and you didn't count the cost to the spiritual battle because they didn't want to talk to you about the reality. And as such, you're not armed correctly and you can't do battle correctly. And then we end up struggling majorly as a result. So let's go ahead and continue here in verse nine and says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. So remember, he said, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, right? Um, give us this day our daily bread. So you ask for the kingdom to come. You ask for daily bread. And in order for you to get those things, you needed to, one, be forgiven and forgive others. So where it says right here, asking it will be given to you. He gave the analogy about somebody knocking on a friend's door who might be asleep. So you went to the father and you asked for it. So it says, okay, you asked for it. It will be given to you. So that's Luke, you know, 11, one through four, but then there's more. So you just can't only do the asking, which is what it's saying in 11, one through four. It also says, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. So there's some seeking that must go on and some knocking that must go on. So the illustration where he said, if you go knocking on a friend's door, asking for the bread, this is proof that Luke one through four continue through here and he's still teaching them how to pray. You can't say, oh, he's talking about a different door now with a different reason. It doesn't make any sense. So verse 10 says, for everyone who asks receives. So you see that for everyone who asks receive. So I'm going to go ahead and put an emphasis on everyone. Why? Because he says right after that, the one who seeks finds. See, everybody might ask, but not everybody is seeking. So everyone who asks receives, but it's not going to come through to you where you can actually put your tangible spiritual hands on it unless you are one of the one who seeks finds. So Jesus is the one. So you got to be in Christ. So you can't just ask and receive. Well, you say, I am in Christ. Well, Christ is the word of God. So if you're not digging into the word of God, if you're not seeking him as if you seek fine treasure, you can't, he can't tell you in one scripture, seek for me as you're seeking for a lost treasure or a, a, a diamond in a field. You can't come at me uh, less than that. If that's the analogy I gave you when it says that's the way you find me. So the one who seeks finds has to do it in accordance to the other verses that talk about seeking God and finding him. So you just can't ask and then you receive and call it a day. The one who seeks finds. Well, you have to seek him with all your heart. And then he says, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So the door will be open. He won't be saying to you from the outside of the door. I can't come and give you anything. So he's telling you, this is the heart of God now. There was the friend who, you know, he won't argue with you a bit. He still might hook you up, but he, he you know, he's going to argue a bit. I know you come knocking on my door and I'm, I'm all asleep. I might come open the door, but I will be a little bit, you know, begrudged, <laughs> right? God's not begrudged at all. And so verse 11, he says, which of you fathers? Now you're going to what? Because you first you said father. Hallowed be your name. So again, he's continuing on with Luke 11, one through four, because he told you, ask the father. And now he's given the analogy, which of you fathers, if he asked for a fish, will give him a snake instead. So not just a friend. Now we're talking about the father. Or if he asked for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, now there you go, though you are evil. So categorically, if Jesus does not forgive your sins, you are still categorically evil. The only thing making you not categorically evil is your sins being forgiven, never counted against you. So only in Christ can you not be categorically evil. But you can come to, to, to the Father, even if you were categorically evil, there goes the shameless audacity, and God can hook you up but you're going to have to seek him. Well, that means something's got to happen because you can't remain categorically evil and continue to seek him. And then you're going to find him. It's not going to work because you have to seek him with all your heart. So you're going to have to decide which way you're going to go. So in verse 13, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask 
him, to those who ask him. So he's saying to you, the Holy Spirit is that bread. The word of God is that bread, right? Where he's making the bread with ingredients. Well, the, his bread has to have the Holy Spirit as the main ingredient. So how much will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him to go, well, Rodney, I got baptized and I received the Holy Spirit and I'm still not that fired up about the word and I'm doing drive-by quiet times, et cetera. Who told you you had the Holy Spirit doing that? Who told you you still got it? But if you got a deposit, it might be a pilot light by now. But there's some other stuff that can happen if you're not feeding it the spiritual bread every day. You're not going to be strong in the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit needs some action. It has to be accompanied by some action for it to spark and to flame, right? Jesus and Beelzebub, verse 14. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke. So when the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke. So the demon was mute. And so it wasn't that the man was mute. It was the demon that was mute. Well, how come we always take whatever we think that's contrary to the word or feel that's contrary to the word and say, I. So first off, if you're not fired up about the word, you shouldn't be saying, I just can't get into the word or I'm not very fired up about the word of God. You should be saying there's a demon who's not fired up and there's a demon that don't want to dig in. And then at least now you can target it and something can be done. So when the demon left the man who had been mute spoke and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Wow. So, you know, when you don't want to do what you need to be doing and somebody else is doing what you need to be doing and they need to be doing, but they're doing it. You can either say, amen, this person is digging in, doing what they need to be doing, and I need to get off my tail and get with them and start doing it too. Or you can do like this and say, well, you know, it's not all good anyway. What they doing isn't, you know, I could do better than that or whatever the case may be, or, you know, it's not all this or it's not all that. And that's what they're doing. So they got to try to put Jesus down because they don't have the heart to do what Jesus has done and is doing, which is he's in love with the word of God because he is the word of God, but he had opportunity to go the other route and he didn't. He was tempted and he didn't. That's why he tells us we don't need to be tempted, right? Ask the Lord to not lead us into temptation because Jesus is saying, hey, I went through that. That's no joke. So he's over there, you know, defeated everything. And as a result, they're over here now having to try to put him down. Verse 16 says, others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. So he, he casting out demons and it's still not good enough. They need a sign from heaven. Well, he is the one sent from heaven. So they need a sign more than him who's doing the act that the Old Testament said only God could do. This man is doing them. And so now it's the demons that's got to be doing it. You see how people can come up with anything. You can come up with anything to justify you over what somebody else is doing. Well, yeah, but yeah, but right. Verse 17, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? Now, you know, this is still in relation to Luke 1 through 4. So now remember, when Jesus told them to pray, your kingdom come, then here it is, if you ask for that, then you're telling God that's what you want. You want his kingdom to come. Well, if you want his kingdom to come, you want the demonic kingdom to go, to leave. And so guess what has to happen? Demons got to be driven out. We go, oh, I don't want to deal with that level. I don't want to deal with that stuff. 
then you got to know what you're asking for. Because if you say your kingdom come, and you know, people saying it, but they're going, Jesus, you do it all. I don't really want to be active in that. I want you to do all the work in and of yourself. Like, well, how are you a disciple of Jesus Christ then if Jesus has got to do it all, right? He's given us his Holy Spirit, the counselor, to counsel us, work with us. He's given us the Holy Spirit with the power. And we saw Peter and Paul and all those apostles doing these incredible things and driving out demons, et cetera. And so how are we saying we don't want to do it that way as if there's another way, right? And so verse 17 said, Jesus knew their thoughts. Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. That means your own household. That means whatever, any kind of situation. It doesn't matter if it's two against two, one against three, three against one. If everybody is not on the same page as it relates to the word of God and you're divided against each other, it's going to not go well. Everybody in the house has to be on the same page, no matter what house it is. And he's saying, even Satan, verse 18, if Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? So he's going, even he has to be united. So wait a minute. You got to be united in Christ and Satan's side has to be united. And people are not united. And so what's happening? Lukewarm. That's why in Revelation it says you're lukewarm. He'll spit you out of the mouth. We did that study. And we've gone over maps where I show the gray, which says you're trying to be made righteous by the by faith and righteous by the law at the same time. That's not going to work. I've had different brothers and sisters that I've talked to over years that told me, well, there's a gray area. I'm like, well, yeah, there's a gray area to us. Like we've created a gray area by, you know, being lukewarm or focusing on the faith and then trying to be made righteous by the law. But that gray area is not really gray. It's black. And so it's, it's you're going by the law or you're going by faith. Is one or the other, right? It's righteous or unrighteous, and you can only be credited righteous by faith. So by the law, you're going to be deemed unrighteous. Only Jesus is righteous by the law. So it's only white or black. It's not gray, but I admit that people have made it gray, and that is called lukewarm. And so he's saying you can't be lukewarm. That won't even work on Satan's team. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? So I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now, if I, Beelzebub, Beelzebub and other uh, uh, passages and whatever, and they say it's connected to Beelzebub in the Old Testament, and there's a lot of scholarly debate on that. So let's just go with what it's saying here, Beelzebub. Verse 19, now if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So your people. So whom do your followers drive them out? Right. So he's talking to who he's talking to the people that are saying that and nine times out of 10, that being the Pharisees. And that's what some scholars say that he was talking to the Pharisees as it relates to that, because they were the ones saying this, trying to convince the people of this, because the people were starting to get into Jesus saying, hey, this man is, you know, the son of God, etc. So he's going, well, whom do your followers drive them out? Well, one, this guy still had. Him. So his followers weren't driving them out. Two, if they're not being driven out, then how is God's kingdom come? So even in asking your kingdom come, the other kingdom has to go. And so they have to be driven out because the kingdom is within. So you just can't take new wine and put it in old wine skins. You got to drive the demons out so the Holy Spirit can reside in. And then it says, so then they will be your judges. Who will be your judges? The people that see that you can't drive the demons out and you're afraid to even have the conversation about its truth. That would be a warning sign to me. In verse 20, it says, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So there it is. So there's another proof that he's still connecting it to Luke's one through four, 11, one through four, because he's saying the finger of God. I drive out demons by the finger of God. Well, the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus Christ is saying, I'm the one 
who wrote the Ten Commandments in the stone, that was done by the finger of God. So it's proven that therein lies Jesus with Moses, and it's showing it again because the Ten Commandments was put on stone, written by the finger of God. And Jesus is saying, I'm driving demons out by the finger of God. And then he says, the kingdom of God has come upon you. So if you ask your kingdom come, and then the kingdom has come, the kingdom of God has come upon you, then it has to be done by the finger of God. The finger of God being the word of God. So how do you drive out demons? By the word of God. You start showing the light of the gospel and it starts attacking the darkness, falsehoods, hiding behind scriptures, not wanting to bring out what the truth of the word is, afraid people might leave your ministry, etc. right? Instead of just laying it out plain and all the above and even more. Verse 21. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. So when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. So you can be considered to be strong in the Lord, fully armed by the word of God, etc., and you guard in your own house, that means your temple, your body. He's using a, a worldly illustration so that they can understand. So he's saying, if you were guarding your own physical house, right, your household with your address over there, you had some guns and you a strong man and you had a bunch of guns and you guarding your house because you fully armed and because you protecting your possessions up inside there, then yeah, you would be safe if that happens, right? Okay. Amen. Verse 22 through 32. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, that means stronger than you. That means even with your guns, etc. if somebody stronger attacks and overpowers you, he will take away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. So the thief is going to come in anyway, stronger and more powerful than you, take away all that armor and rob your house anyway. So he's saying the same thing. You got to be strong in the gospel, because if you're not, somebody's going to be stronger than you. Well, who's going to be stronger than you? Well, we already saw the illustration he just finished doing where this man was mute because of demons. And they had to get the mute demon out of the man so he could be OK. So he was the demon mute was stronger than the man and he overpowered the man. OK, so that's what will happen. So you have to be strong in the Lord, strong in the faith, in a relationship with Jesus Christ, strong in the word of God, strong in prayer, strong in walking by the spirit. Therein lies your armor. And we studied last week the armor of God covering the feet, the head, the chest, the waist, the whole body. The word of God, the sword, the shield, etc. And so therein lies the armor. That armor has to be strong. So your relationship with Jesus, you're paying attention to detail, you're digging in the word, you're praying, everything that needs to keep you strong in Christ Jesus, relying on him, having faith in him has to be strong. So God is saying, if you, if you dig into my word, dig into my word, you will know how to rely on Jesus. You will become more accustomed to rely on Jesus who's still alive and the Holy Spirit, which is alive. And therein lies them coming to your aid because you're going to call on to them and you're going to be able to use the word. When Jesus was being tempted by Satan, Satan was throwing stuff out and Jesus was using the word. So you're going to have to be able to use the word. In verse 23, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. So there and again is either black or white, right? It's either night or day. We're either with him. We're either reigning as priests or we're not. We're either with him or we're scattering. So an example would be Paul. When Paul was not with the Lord, right, 
he was persecuting the church and the people were scattered, right? And they scattered all over the place to all these different houses because he, he chased them out of the temple. So he wasn't with the Lord. Once he got with the Lord, then he started to gather. So if you're not with me, you're scattering. And that's what happens a lot. And, and so even so with a person, because you'll scatter that. You'll be all over the place, right? You won't be with the word. You be, you'll be all over the world. Your brain will be going all over the place instead of focused on the word of God. And your two plus two will be 488 instead of two plus two equals four because you will be scattered. Right. Because the, the 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 demons and all coming in, scattering you all over the place and people will be saying you scatter brain. So whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Verse 24, when an impure spirit comes out of a person. So he's going right back to what they just saw. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. So an impure spirit is looking for some place to dwell. Even when Jesus kicked them out, they said, can we go over there and those pigs? So they are looking for a spot. So if they're looking for a spot, how in the world are we not being told, not being taught, the conversation is not happening, on a consistent all out basis that there are impure spirits roaming around. As Satan says, going back and forth in the earth through it. There are impure spirits just roaming, looking for some place to go. And you're not armed with spiritual power. Looking on the lookout for something crazy to try to live in you. Through your mind, through your heart what you look at, what you listen to, all of that is trying to get in and then get rest. That means the thought is trying to get in and build a nest in your head, right? Incorrect thinking, er errant thinking, wrong beliefs, etc. cetera. It's trying to find a home where you believe something's the word of God, not even the word of God, where you thought Luke one through four, was, that was all there was. And you've been doing that prayer forever and thinking that you're all good and not knowing that the rest of this is giving us illustrations, not even knowing that Luke 11, 1 through 4 was talking about getting demons out. And so it's, look, it's looking for rest, but it don't find it, right? And then it says, I will return to the house I left, to the person I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. So yeah, you got your stuff together, but then what? Your armor wasn't tight. Your faith in Jesus wasn't tight. You wasn't digging into the word of God. So everything was swept clean and put in order. And then it got crazy again because you're not digging in and making sure the place stay clean. So verse 26 says, then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. That's what's happening. It's coming in with an onslaught against you. So if seven more are coming in, then wouldn't you need to be seven times more spiritual? Seven days in a week, right? So every day, one day is Sunday. So you got people going to church on Sunday, getting game one day. Yeah, hopefully you get in game that one day. Right. There's some cats out there giving that game on that day. But there's six more days. Right. There's six more days. So you need to get full on the word every day, because if not, it says in 26 and a half. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. This is really called counting the cost. You got to count the cost, whether or not you're going to be devoted and dedicated to the word of God. That means it's going to take Bible study, walking it and talking it, learning it and adhering to it. It's going to take it all. It's all encompassing. It is not a category. It is not a school curriculum where it's one class out of eight 
or it's one part of a whole master's degree or whatever the case may be. No, 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 no. It's all encompassing. It's everything. If the word of God created the entire universe, then the word of God would be everything. So it's actually impossible to be in the world and it not be a part of the word of God. So why would people then be in the world without the word of God? It doesn't make any sense. The word of God created it. But if you go the other route, the final condition of that person is worse than the first. In verse 27, it says that Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out. Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Two things here. Here's this woman, right? Because it says a woman in a crowd. She want to give props to the women, right? Blessed is your mother who gave you birth instead of blessed is the father in heaven who sent you, right? So she can't go beyond the earth realm. She couldn't go and see it from the heavenly realm. So you got these other people saying, hey, 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 you know, give us a sign from heaven. And then she focused on the mother instead of Father God in heaven. And so even when somebody tries to give you a, 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 some props, you got to listen to what they say, what they're saying. The blessed is the mother who gave you birth. What Jesus at one point told Peter, no one, uh, Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God unless it's born again. So when she says, bless as a mother, instead of bless God who, who brought you forward for us, then obviously she can't see the kingdom. So you got to be careful about people saying they can see the kingdom and all they can talk about is earthly things and can't describe God, the father, as it relates to his son and, you know, everything else as it relates to dealing with these demons in the back room that's trying to take us out and come in seven times more powerful than when we got them taken out. You got baptized, you got clean, and now they're trying to come back with seven more looking to see if you got your armor tight and then making sure that your armor is the word of God, which is Jesus Christ, so that Jesus Christ has got your protection. Sign of Jonah, verse 29. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. It asked for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Look, you know, Jesus is not about trying to please people. He's not a people pleaser. He's not afraid to say something that people might run off. He's God in the flesh. He's the Lord Almighty. And so what, what you going to do? The Lord tell you what time it is. He tell you the truth you don't want to hear. What you going to do? So you're going to look at you and go, this is a wicked generation. What you going to do about it? Right? You got to accept it. So all that pride and don't talk to me this way and all that goofiness that, and, and then saying, well, you know, being godly means, bro, that you say it all nicey and, you know, you make sure that it's all with a bow on it and, you know, it's all nightly put in a box and it's perfect. And you're talking all that, you know, that that preacher jargon talk where it all sounds all proper, et cetera. Amen. If that's the way you talk and that's the normal way you talk. Amen. Like if you talk like that and I come and catch you at the store and Walmart or in, in Costco, you know, because some of y'all don't be saying Walmart about me. You know, hey, I go to Walmart and Trader Joe's. It don't matter to me. They got stuff at Walmart I want. They got stuff at Trader Joe's I want. But the bottom line is I'm hoping that when I'm reading the word of God and you talk to me on without me reading scripture, that I sound like the same guy, right? So he says, this is a wicked generation. It asked for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. We know Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and Jesus went to the belly of the earth for three days, etc. But he says in verse 30, but for as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the son of man be to this generation. So Obviously, the fulfillment of it was not going to happen until he rose from the dead. And so this generation, that generation would get the opportunity to hear that Jesus rose from the dead. And of course, there was witnesses who saw it 
And we're now taking witness accounts of that. We see that in the gospels, we see it in the New Testament. And so all of that is that sign. And so in verse 31, it says, the queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. So queen of the South, the queen of Sheba, she came over there with a caravan, bringing all types of gold and jewels and brought them to Solomon, listen to his wisdom and see how much game he's got. And when she heard his game, she saw his wealth too. But if she was coming there only for his wealth, she wouldn't have came there and brought him wealth. So Solomon ended up more wealthy when she left than before she arrived. And he was already the richest man running around the earth in his time. So the queen of the South went all the way across the desert, Africa, to meet up with this Solomon king because of the people saying that they've heard his wisdom. So that's people giving testimony to his wisdom. So she heard about his reputation. And so she came. Well, we've heard about Jesus from eyewitness account from his apostles. And we've hearing other people since then talk about the greatness of the Lord. And so when it comes down to the wisdom of Jesus, he's infinitely more greater than Solomon because Jesus never started building false gods and craziness following behind a bunch of women. And Solomon did. So how much wisdom does Jesus have compared to Solomon? And his wisdom is found in the word of God. So Jesus is going, the queen of the south will rise against you because you got somebody greater than Solomon. He's giving you his word that you can find in a book, online, everywhere, basically. And you're not digging into it to get that wisdom. And I ran over there, went across the desert to get game. And you can just in your own home, just go and check out the game. And you won't even do that. The queen of the south will rise up in judgment against you. And she will rise up in judgment against them because they had the word of the Lord there in person to ask him anything they wanted to know. Verse 32, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. So they're going to stand up at the, at the generation, at the judgment with this generation and condemn it also. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. So we should be repenting at the word of God, at the preaching of Jesus and anyone who's preached Jesus in correctness like the apostles did. So basically the New Testament, the four gospels. And now something that greater than Jonah is here. So when we talk about Jesus' resurrection and that he died for our sins, that good news should prompt anybody to at least have enough curiosity to go search it out and see what time it is, right? Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 33 through 42. The lamp of the body. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. So the light has an actual stand, a proper place. And so Jesus is the light. And so he has a proper place. He went to the right hand of the Father. That's his proper place. He sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts where Jesus resides in us. Remember the study Christ in you. So that's his proper place. Well, if Jesus is going to live in there, with his Holy Spirit, the demons got to go. And so you can't be hiding. You can't say, I don't want to learn about how to deal with these demonic powers. I don't want to know anything about that. Oh, no, no, no. I just want that quiet Christian life, right? I don't want anything at that depth. And so as a result, 
You go, I just want to be in the corner. I just want to go to church, hang out in the corner of the church, come home, call it a day. I don't want to be doing no battling. I don't want to be dealing with nothing heavy, nothing deep, and none of that. No, that doesn't work. The lamp of the body. So your body has a lamp. It's the word of God. And so you can't yourself be put under a bowl. You got to be put on a stand. Jesus is trying to put you out there so that people can see him in you. Not for showing off you. It's not about putting you on display because you got on the best suit. It's putting you on display to show that you're in love with the word of God. He wants you to be on display for that, not to display your personal love, that your personal love will display that he is real. And so that your conviction is to spread him the light that people see your conviction and as a result, they gain conviction and they can fall in love with the true spirit of the Lord in Jesus Christ that you did. And so he wants to put you on a stand so that those who come in may see the light. So when people come in to anywhere where you are, yeah, it could be a congregation. It could be a quote unquote a building, church building. It could be your own house. It could be anywhere where you are, where you are now elaborating, congregating, communicating, praising, singing, whatever, as it relates to the word of God, that people see that you are for real and that you love him. But if you're with the word of God on a service and then people catch you somewhere else and you know everything else about you, is not the word of God, that's not going to go with. Verse 34, your eye is the lamp of your body. So there it is. So he says, no one likes a lamp and put it in a place where it will be hidden. And your eye is the lamp of the body. So how you see life, how you prioritize life, what moves you? What are you about? That is what must be seen. And to be honest with you, it is going to be seen one way or another. Regardless of what you say, people will see what you're really all about. Are you just talk? Or are you trying to do this for real? Does that mean they need to see perfection? No. Because it already said, forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So one way they're going to see it is you holding grudges and you're not forgiving. And they're going to go, hmm, where's Jesus? Right? You go, well, that person hasn't shown me no repentance. But that's between them and Jesus. But as far as you're concerned, you can forgive them. Right. Do I need to forgive them if they hit me upside the head and let them keep hitting me upside the head? No, no, no. I'm going to make sure you can't keep hitting me upside the head now. But I'm going to forgive you for the hit upside the head I took. But since you haven't repented, I'm going to stay up out your way. You can't be hitting me upside the head. Right now, you know, I will. Let's keep on. When your eyes are healthy, <laughs> your whole body also is full of light. So when your eyes are healthy. Your whole body also is full of light. So how you see this thing, how you see what? The prayer started off by saying, Father, hallowed be your name. So how you see the Father? Do you first see the Father has no wickedness in him? Do you first see the Father as pure? And do you see Jesus that way? Well, they were saying Jesus was casting out people by Beelzebub. So do you see Jesus that way? Do you see forgiveness that way? Do you see credited by faith, being credited as righteousness that way? And as such, do you see your sins are already forgiven or are you holding on to your sin? And as such, are you seeing that you're a new creation and you're getting away from the old person, the new self versus the old self? All of that is important is 
how you see things is your eye focusing on the word of God, how much time you're spending in the word of God versus how much time are you spending looking at a bunch of unhealthy stuff to be looking at. Because whatever it is that your eye is spending most of its time on, that is going to become what you are about. So when you are healthy, then your whole body is healthy and full of light. But when you are unhealthy, it says, but when they are unhealthy, your body also is full of darkness. So demons come in based on what you are focusing on and how you are focusing. So we think, oh, I'm just looking at something. I'm going to tell you right now, as I'm reading this, this is really, really convicting right here. Because demons get the green light to come in based on what you're checking out. Woo, that's heavyweight. That's heavyweight. You can't be looking at craziness and then going, no, no, no. It was just, you know, me looking at cra craziness, but there was actually no result or repercussion. No. If you're looking at craziness, you just told craziness that come on in. You just welcomed craziness. You invited craziness. If you looked at it, you invited it, right? If you, if you looked at it, you let it come in. You brought it in. You brought it into your body. So we got, oh, I got to repent of that. I can't be looking at that kind of craziness because I just let a demon in, right? We got we to gotta be looking at the right stuff. So how you see life is the difference between whether your body is full of light or whether your body is full of darkness. You can't be in between lukewarm. Verse 35, see to it then that the light within you is not darkness. The light within you is not darkness. So you go, wait, wait a minute, how does that work? Well, in the Garden of Eden, what does Satan say? Then you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he said, here's this knowledge that is dressing itself up like light, but it's really darkness. It's knowledge, but it's not good knowledge because it's knowledge to try to make you better than God, to make you more than what you are, to, to, to dress you up in this false game, this false knowledge. So see to it then that the light within you is not darkness. It's not this knowledge of doing things the incorrect way. It's not Luke 1 through 4. And then the rest of it is not telling you what time it is. So you didn't count the cost right. You don't know to be on the watch out for demons. You don't know that if you pray your kingdom come, that means that everything else that we're talking about is included, right? The fine print. So you bought the package based on Luke 1 through 4, and you didn't read the fine print, which is the rest of the verses that we're looking at. And then after the fact, you say, well, I didn't know what I bought. So verse 36, therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines its light on you. You go, well, wait a minute. That's impossible because all men sin and fall short of the glory of God. So how could that be? I have to ask God for forgiveness every day. I got to keep asking God for forgiveness. You go, I need to be forgiven just to be right with God all the time. No, I'm asking for forgiveness because I am right with God. Because God is telling me it's not me. It's you got the opposition flying around looking for you to be looking at craziness, looking for you to look crazy, looking for you to accept falsehood as realities. And as such, that's why they asked Jesus to question. Satan asked him the questions to see what he knew. That's why he said to the woman, you know, hey, you shall not surely die. Did God tell you don't eat of this, et cetera? And she didn't know the answer. So that the other side is looking for that which you do not know, is looking for you to be looking at life the wrong way. And so as a result, 
You got to be going to God with this armor and going to the word all the time so that God can see us being built up. Now, he'll protect us, but we have to be getting built up so that we can have on this armor because we got to be able to go out there and help him help others, right? So if your whole body is full of light and no part of it is dark, so you go, well, how is no part? I still don't get it. How is no part dark? Because blessed is the man who sins and not counted against you. So Jesus Christ will keep them demons from living in you if your devotion and commitment is to him, the word of God. It will always override. So when you start thinking the craziness, when you start being tempted with the craziness, you go to the word, right? If you trip, but you, you not fall, you stumble, you go to the word, you get that out of there, right? So no part of it dark. It doesn't mean temptation didn't happen, even though he says to ask that you not be led into temptation, but led into temptation. But you can take yourself into temptation and not even be led. So he's saying you got to be constant, consistent, so that anything dark is always being rooted out. Woes on the Pharisees and the experts in the law. Verse 37. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. Jesus went in and reclined at the table. He didn't go in and sit all proper and act like he's all proper and all square. And I know you like to go in, you know, you want to go to the nice restaurant. You want to get dressed up. You want to go out, etc. But Jesus came in and just reclined at the table. I know if Jesus came in reclining at the table and you didn't know he was Jesus and you went on a date with him, that you might get a little bit embarrassed because you at the bougie restaurant and Jesus is over there reclining. Now, I'm not saying go to the bougie restaurant and go in there acting a fool. But I'm saying Jesus wasn't going in there acting a fool, but he wasn't going to go over there paying attention to all these bougie folks either. So when Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him and he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. So he's like, hold on now. This cat is uncouth. So first they didn't say he, he, he's driving out demons by Beelzebub, which you can't get no dirtier than that, right? In terms of what's inside of you. That's like utter wickedness. You got the potential to go get seven times more craziness in you. That's like pitch black, basically. And they over here talking about him washing before a meal. And they running around there pitch black. And then 39, it says, then the Lord said to him, now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. So, yeah, you all cleaned up on the outside. But on the inside, it's a bunch of crazy thoughts going on. You at the restaurant even thinking crazy. Here it is. He's at the Pharisee's house. You got God Almighty. and You're supposed to be a Pharisee, a teacher of the word, a Levite, etc. And you over there with God Almighty in your home. And you over there trying to convince people that they got to be all proper. And you over here looking at God Almighty like he's uncouth. And you running around here with a black soul. That's what happened. And what made it happen? Greed and wickedness. Greed and wickedness. So it's not about how dressed up you are. It's not about how clean you look at the table with the best clothes, driving the best car. When you rolled up, you rolled up in the freshest ride. And they made sure you got VIP parking. And y'all came out there stepping with Gucci and Prada. I understand. I hear you. I like me some stuff. But verse 40 says, you foolish people, right? If you think that's what it is, instead of how clean are you on the inside? How dapper are you on the inside? So if you dapper on the outside, but on the inside, you got all kind of crazy thoughts going on. Your life is crazy. Then he's saying, you foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? So here's the one sitting in front of him 
who made the whole entire universe, including all the ingredients in which you can make a cup and a dish. And he made humankind too. And he's sitting right in front of your face. He's the one breathing to man the breath of life. And man became a, a living soul. And you over here telling him about a cup and a dish. Mm -mm -mm. Verse 41. But now as for what is inside you, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor. Why? Because they were greedy and wicked. So that means that each of us has got a little bit something different, that core sin. There's something specifically that's core in us that might be different for each person. It's all sin, but there's something core in us that Jesus is going, that core thing, I need you to deal with that. So, but now as for what is inside of you, be generous to the poor. That was their core thing, greed. And everything will be clean for you. If you can deal with this core thing, then everything else will change about you. It will change how you act. It will change who you are. It will change what motivates you. It will change how you criticize everything. Everything will change about you if you deal with this core sin in you. And in verse 42, it says, woe to you Pharisees, because you give a tenth of your mint rue and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. So justice, yeah, justice is a big deal. You neglect justice. You giving ties all over the place, but you siding with a bunch of unjust, unjust activity. That's not who you are at heart. You really don't care too much about justice for other folks or justice in general, right? So you can give a tithe all day. He's talking about the synagogue. You could be going to church. You can go dressed up. You can look good. You can put a whole bunch of money in the pot. Tell me this ain't what he's saying. But your heart, neglecting justice and the love of God who hates injustice, you don't have his heart. And as a result, you're criticizing people that don't look like you because they're not all dressed up. They don't have them. They're not on the same social ladder you own. So you're looking down on folks, et cetera. That's what he said. He says, you should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Oh, boy, there you go. There's them greedy people saying, see, 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 you got to get the tide. You got to get the tide. You got to get the tide. Even though the New Testament says, give on what you have decided to give. God loves a cheerful giver. So that's on you and God. You want to give a tide, give a tide. You want to get 50%, give 50%. He can make you so rich, you can live off the tide. All that's between you and the Lord. But what he's saying is, he's not saying you should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone in terms of the tithe. He's talking about everything from verse five. The example was verse one through four, where he says, say these things. And then he starts talking about everything in verse five. And he's letting the ones know that asked them to teach us how to pray that this is all the stuff you're going to be dealing with because you're saying your kingdom come. So now he's exposing all the stuff that's out here in these different authoritative positions, et cetera, and that's in your heart and in this world and how the world operates and what people think are this or that and clean and not clean, et cetera, and how people are judging people in the social circles, et cetera. He's talking about all of that when he says, without leaving the former undone. They go, see, only the former undone meant verse 42. Come on, man. He's talking about everything from five to 42 in reference to prayer one through four, all right? You just can't be doing the tithe. And that's that's the, any, anybody who's saying that, that's already a, just a, 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 a warning sign, just going boo, 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 greed, 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 greed. Anybody that'll tell you that. Hallelujah. Verse 43 through 54 in conclusion. Woe to you Pharisees because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. So of all you say in this tithing, you didn't neglect it all the other 42 verses, 41 verses, what have you. 
and then he's back on you again. You want the most important seats in the synagogues? That too. You can't say all oh, the rest of this is no good, but the tithing one was good. As long as you give them the tithe, the other 40 something, you know, 42 verses is, you know, is irrelevant. Come on now. Uh, I'm not going to harp on this too long, but he's just talking about, you know, wanting to look important, act like you're important, pretend like you're important versus what's important. What's important is the word of God. Making sure you stay focused on that every day, all day. Give us this day, our daily bread. Making sure that you get that daily bread. Don't show up only on a Sunday, even putting that on the pastor. Even the best pastors out there doing what they can do, having a heart for the Lord, or preachers or evangelists or whatever, whatever you want to call them. There's people out there giving their hearts to the Lord. Even they can't do it for you 24-7, 365. The best you can do is if you show up two hours on a midweek, two hours on a Sunday or whatever the case may be, man, the, the, the pastor don't have enough time for everybody to call their phone number 24-7. You need some more spiritual people up in there, right? Well, hey, the ones who want the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces, and that's your mode, and that's what that's all about, if that's who you're relying on, as your spiritual guide, your leader, right? Versus a leader, your leader is Jesus because he's the only one that can lead you 24-7, 365, even in your night when you dream, even when you sleep, right? He says he will give his, uh, your, your young men and women will see visions and dreams. So even your visions and dreams, God can handle that. That's the person who has to be the leader. He's the one that wants the most important seat in any synagogue and in any marketplace, period. No matter where you go, Jesus has to be number one. Verse 44, woe to you. Woe to you who isn't saying that and who's not thinking that way and who's acting a different way. Woe to you because you are like unmarked graves which people walk over without knowing it. So yeah, there's a lot of people who don't know that they're in a dead church with a dead congregation, with a dead preacher, et cetera, who looking really, really good, dressed up really, really nice, and is afraid to go down and just talk about the word of God plain, straight out. If they're not talking about people being crooked, greedy people in churches, anybody who's afraid to say that, that's an issue, right? Because if you're not one of them, if you're a preacher doing the right thing and you're not greedy and you're not trying to, you know, you're not, it's just, yeah, that's not your heart. Then why would you be afraid to say it? Why? Because people might start looking at you like that might be a possibility, right? Well, man, if that's not who you are, that's not who you are. Why somebody looking at, why worried about people looking at you that way? So he's saying unmarked graves. So an unmarked grave, people walking over it, but they don't even know it's a grave. It's unmarked, right? Including that means no name, no date on it. So here this person is, another time they call it a whitewashed tomb, but they're saying walking over it without knowing it. So they're already basically dead and you don't even know it and you just rolling with them and you just walking over it without knowing it. That's the concept, which means you're rolling with somebody. And you won't even know that they're not even in a relationship with Jesus Christ, but yet they preaching every day. You have a high day preaching and not in the relationship with Jesus Christ. You can do that, right? Because you can cut and paste what you want to preach. You can throw stuff out there and use one verse and get 50 million analogies that has nothing to do with the verse. Instead of breaking down the verse, Jesus gave his own analogies, right? So in verse 45, one of the experts in the law answered him, teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Sorry to say, but Jesus didn't care about insulting somebody. He's going to tell the truth. If that insults you, then that's on you. But this is God in the flesh. 
What does God need to bite his tongue for on what he says? And he's God in the flesh. He made everybody. And now this expert in the law want to be above everybody else. Well, I know you're talking about everybody else, but hey, hey, you talking about me now. You talking about us experts in the law. You know, you insulting us now too. We ain't, we not like them unwashed masses. Nah, 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 nah. Any person, if you're in a church situation, if you're in a ministry situation where the person's not in the mix with you, they're not down with you, they're not going through the stuff with you, they're not talking about dealing with this world and the struggles and the trials and the tribulations and the demons and everything else that's going on, because everybody that said, he said he told those disciples who are now the apostles and he told them, this is how you pray. And you say thy kingdom come. And this is all the hell that comes with it. So that means anybody who's saying thy kingdom come, which would be a disciple of Jesus Christ, a Christian, et cetera, knowing that we're dealing with drama. We are dealing with craziness. And this is a fight and it's a spiritual warfare. So anybody talking like it's not, and they got it going on, and they're above you, right? I went to this one guy's stuff. He was a real well-known uh, minister, and he said, hey, go ahead and, you know, address everybody who's next to you, and I was securing him and his family, and the guy next to me was from this TV ministry thing, and homeboy didn't even look my way. He didn't even look my way. He was like, oh, this guy's security. He had no idea who I was, right? Had, didn't have a clue who I was spiritually. Like, oh, okay, Jesus said he'll come as the one who, 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 who waits on tables. So Jesus came as a servant to all of us, and he's the Lord, he's the king. But you, you think you know who everybody is based on their positions that you think they're in. Come on, man. And so he goes, verse 46, Jesus replied, and you experts in the law, woe to you. Because you load people down with burdens they will they can hardly carry. So you start coming up with, hey, we need 20 times, 30 times, 40 times your tithe. People can barely eat, barely got enough food, feeding their kids soup for a year. And now you're going to tell them 30 times, 40 times, et cetera, because you're scared to tell them what the New Testament says, which is give what you can give with, out of your cheerful heart. Let them deal with the Lord. The Lord rewards those with faith. Uh, he gives different people different measures of faith. He's blessing people in different ways. You have who been, been blessed financially. Hey, God bless you. But don't go out there telling everybody to go broke because they're trying to give it to a quote unquote building game. And then saying that's the ministry because of some just some full time ministry guys and saying that's the ministry. The ministry is the kingdom of God worldwide, past, present, future, and including the universe and all the angels, et cetera, and millions of angels. That's the kingdom of God. And there's areas of the kingdom of God. Money can only even deal with a, a very small, minute part. If you took, if you, if you added up the part of the kingdom of God that could even actually deal with money. And you did that on a scale of, let's say, 1% to 100%, it wouldn't even reach 1%. It'd be 0.0000001% on with a bunch of zeros before that one in terms of how far money could actually go as it relates to the kingdom of God. Why are people making it seem like it's the most important thing there is in the entire universe that is even more important, making sure people understand that there are demons out here trying to get back into their world, into their life, into their hearts, into their bodies to take them out. All righty. So verse 46, you experts in the law, you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourself will not lift one finger to help them. And then people go out there coming home, wondering what time it is, thinking they didn't did an investment to God and they didn't put ties out there. And guys like Wall Street about to give them 10 times the money back based on a tie to a ministry with a dead pink preacher. And then it says, verse 47, woe to you because you build tombs for the prophets and it was your ancestors who killed them. Right. 
So your ancestor killed them. And now you can take a little bit of money out of the ministry to go build a tomb for the prophet. And in verse 48 says, so you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They kill the prophets and you build their tombs, right? Instead of making sure that that stuff isn't going on. They're making sure that you're not afraid of the prophecy when it's prophecy, even if it's against you. But because it was against this dude and that group, they're going to come back and say, oh, we do you know that you insult us too. The mere fact that you can say that insult us too, when Jesus already told everybody else, wicked generation. So what do we deserve? We only deserve to be called a wicked generation in all reality, right? That's all we really can deserve to be called. So when he comes out there and calls you by what he can really call you, like when he told the one, we don't give our food to the dogs. And she didn't take that offense. She said, well, even the dog eat the scraps from the master's table. And then he gave her props. I haven't seen such great faith in all of Israel. Hey, when Jesus call you out, you got to go, well, you right, Jesus, let me get my stuff together. That's best you can do. When the word of God calls you out, you go, man, that's right. I got to get my stuff together. But what the pride do? Pride raises up and say, I know he ain't talking to me. Hey, I shoe. Well, if it doesn't, the shoe fit where? The shoe don't fit, don't wear it. Verse 49, because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles. So because of this, because they're killing prophets and then want to pay for the tomb. So because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. So that's anybody who does not want to hear it. If you don't want to hear it, you want to get rid of it. You want to get rid of it. I don't want to listen to that no more. Oh, no, I got to give me another channel. I don't want to listen to that no more. Let me watch some soap opera or something crazy, right? Something meaningless or brainless. I don't want to focus on the word of God. And so basically that's the same thing. Some of whom you they will kill and others they will persecute. Uh, who do he think he is? I'm just reading the word of God. It's who does the word of God think he is? The word of God is Jesus. Rodney just reading it and breaking it down. But it's not my word, it's his. And I'm taking it in so they can become my word because I want to be one with Jesus who's one with the Father. And that should be everybody's M.O. So all of us should be repenting like the Ninevites. Verse 50, therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. So why that generation? because they received God in the flesh. And he went out there and preached to them from the flesh. This is not, you know, him speaking through the angel to, to Moses and Moses speaking by the spirit of God and all the rest of the prophets, right? And, and, and the patriarchs, et cetera. No, this is God in the flesh. This is Jesus Christ himself. This is the word of God come in the flesh during that generation. And the cross was in that generation, that cross serving as a time machine for sins from past, present, and future, and righteousness, past, present, and future, all coming together at the cross in one person. Two covenants, the law and the faith all being fulfilled in the one man on the cross, son of God, son of man, Jesus Christ. And so that generation will be held responsible because it's a time machine for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world. And he says, yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. So that means that when you today are dealing with the same dynamic, it is going back in time to the cross. That's why what we are being judged on our faith in the cross and Jesus dying on the cross. 
So your faith today is being based on something that happened 2,000 years ago. So as everybody, past, present, and future is all being geared toward that time, 2,000 years ago. If it's 1,000 years from now before the Lord shut this down, then it will still be based on the cross that happened. Then it will be 3,000 years ago. However many thousand years later and however many thousand years before, it'll still be all based on that time. Verse 52, woe to you experts in the law because you have taken away the key to knowledge. Who's the key to knowledge? Jesus Christ the truth, the life, and the way. So you have taken that away. So that means that these people are being hindered by false teaching. They're being hindered to, instead of being uh, coming to Jesus Christ with a full heart and full devotion, as it, it, they act like Jesus is not alive today. When you got people focusing on you, the preacher, more than Jesus Christ, the Lord, and now their dependency is on you, the preacher, instead of Jesus Christ, the Lord, where they could come to Jesus and ask for that wisdom who gives to all without finding fault, and they can start like a babe with milk, and you can help them, right? That's what you're supposed to be doing as a preacher, a teacher, etc., helping folks, helping folks build their personal relationship with God, helping people to understand the word so that they can dig in on themselves, that they can get a conviction themselves, that they can get on fire themselves, and they can go to God himself, right, through Jesus Christ. And as a result, he can build them up in the word, and they can gain more and more knowledge and understanding of the word. And yeah, people can come and listen to you, but they can also help and learn from somebody else and, and teach other people. And iron sharpens iron. We're all learning from each other and being built up in the word. And that's what it's all about. But don't come at telling people that you the end all be all and everybody got to rely on you to have a word of the Lord or to gain the conviction of the Lord or that you the only one with the Holy Spirit and they don't have the the Holy Spirit. That's hindering people and taking away the key to knowledge. Jesus Christ is the key to knowledge, not Rodney Dixon. Rodney Dixon is not the key to knowledge. I got to go to Jesus Christ. You're not the key to knowledge. Jesus is the key to knowledge. Everybody's got to go to Jesus Christ. He's the key to knowledge. And so you take away the key to knowledge, telling people that you're the leader of the church. And you're talking about a little building with a little congregation and calling that the church. How is that not taking away the key to the knowledge? You didn't just shrunk the kingdom. So when he says your kingdom come, he's not talking about no little building or no little congregation or no one little movement in a, in a space and time and in history. Right? That's taking away the key to knowledge. You, didn't, you got people focused on something else that's not the key. The key is the cross. So you yourselves have not entered. Right, the heart of Jesus who went to the cross, the heart, the heart of God who allowed his son to go to the cross to save us. That's the key to knowledge, the cross. You yourselves have not entered. We already read where you can't enter the gate by any other way. You got to enter by the shepherd. He's the shepherd and the gate and gatekeeper is the father. So you yourselves have not entered through that way and you have hindered those who are entering. So there you go. Hindering is taking away the key to knowledge. You have hindered those who were entering. So they were getting fired up about Jesus. They were seeing what Jesus was doing. If they're not worried about their position so much and they weren't so greedy, worried about their livelihood being taken away as quote unquote full time ministers. If they weren't worried about that so much, they would have told people like like uh, John the Baptist did and said, that's the one who's coming after me. But he was before me. That's the one whose sandals I'm not, I'm not worthy to untie. So for him, roll with him, leave me. He must become more, I must become less. All of us have to do that. Everybody has to do that. And if you do that, you won't be hindering the folks from going to the one. So these people, if they would have told them the truth and said, Jesus is the one, he is, he is getting rid of these demons by the power of the, his father on, on high. If they would have said that, you know how many more people would have came to Jesus Christ at that time instead of being hindered? Now, if God's going to bring on who he's going to bring in. You can make the job harder because you won't get out of the way. Verse 53, when Jesus went outside, 
the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely, oppose the word of God, and to beseech him, beseech the word of God with questions. Who did that when he was tempted in the desert for 40 days? He had no food and drink. Satan got some questions for him and throwing out some stuff for him to see how he's going to respond out by the word of God. As God said, if you were the son of God, right? Same thing. So it's showing you them people was full of them demons, seven who knows how many. In verse 54, it says, waiting to catch him in something he might say. Waiting for him to make a hiccup. Looking for him to make a hiccup. What? The word. Looking for the word to be incorrect. They running around, don't even know what they saying, don't even know what they doing, don't know anything. Lost the word a while ago. And they're gonna try to catch him in something he might say. Because they supposed to be quote unquote experts in the law. So Hallelujah. we are either reigning as priests or we are not, says the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. As it says in 1 Peter 2, 9, we are a royal priesthood. And as it says in Revelation 1, 6, he has made us into a kingdom and priest and we will serve our God and we will reign on the earth. That is what we have to do. That is what we have to be. Again, there will not be any open discussion on this particular day. Hope this study did you guys well. We will be back at it with our regular program next week, God willing. Until then, I will tell everybody, peace in.